Coral tomorrow and things. In the plan for the week, you'll see there's a whole list of links here. These are mostly YouTube videos on my channel. that are videos about uh, different kinds of clownfish and stuff. And if you're remote throughout the period, these are the ones I'm going to show. So you might, uh, you know, I'm going to play them through the browser. Oops, hold on, screen sharing. Yeah, I'll play them through the Zoom, but they're a lot clearer if you watch them like separately. And then uh, I'll tell you about the life fish, life, the life cycle of clownfish. And then we're going to watch the opening scene in Finding Nemo. And then it's your job to tell me like what's right and what's not right about what they do in Finding Nemo and stuff. Finding Nemo is pretty incredible. Between Finding Nemo and SpongeBob, that's pretty much all you need to know about oceanography, I guess, which isn't true, but they get a bunch of it right. Uh, let me do this. I'll hit pin, click that thing, move this up here. Oh, that's going to be on there. Okay, that's all right, whatever. Uh, these are a pair of clownfish that we have in the back room, and they're living in among some anemones. Uh, anemones are also animals that are Nidarians. And in that pair of clownfish, the one in the upper left corner is the female, and the one in the lower right is male. And in a pair of clownfish, the female is always considerably larger than the male. And it turns out that when clownfish are born, uh, they are not sex determined yet. They're truly hermaphroditic. And then when a pair of clownfish pair bonds, they swim together, and it's not exactly clearly known as to how it's determined which one becomes male and female, but one will become female and grow particularly large in size and uh, begin to produce eggs. And a male can change into female. So you can have a sexually mature male that has been breeding with a female for a very, very long time, and it may lose the female, find a new pair, bond, and then uh, that male could become female. That happens. So usually when they pair up, they, they pair up for life. And a pair of clowns can live a long time. We've got pa we've got uh, pairs of clowns here in the school in the tanks that you know we've had for ten years. Uh, they you know 10, 15 years, and usually they lay about a thousand eggs every every two weeks, and they can do that for you know a very very long time. So in eight years, if you lay a thousand eggs every fourteen days, that's about two hundred thousand eggs. Uh, Clownfish are very prolific. They lay a lot of eggs, they have a lot of babies, but very, very, very few survive. So here are pictures and processes about what happens from the beginning of uh, clownfish. So here's the thing that, that we do. I actually, I train the clownfish to lay their eggs on a particular surface. So what happens is a pair of clownfish once they begin to spawn, we'll usually lay their eggs in exactly the same place every time. They'll like pick a place, like that's where we're gonna lay the eggs. And that's where they do it all the time. And you leave them in that tank. So this pair of clownfish, turns out they kept laying their eggs against this back corner surface of the tank, uh, right about where this magnet and this ceramic thing are. So they kept laying their eggs right here over and over. You let them lay their eggs there a whole bunch of times. And the thing is, you don't actually want them to lay their eggs on the glass or rock in the tank. You want them to lay their eggs on a surface that you can remove from the tank. And I'll show you why. So the training process goes that they lay their eggs there a whole bunch of times. And then once they've laid their eggs there a bunch of times, they're used to that, that place. You put something over that spot. And it turns out clownfish love glass and ceramic surfaces. So this is actually like a ceramic tile. Uh, this is actually a bullnose tile that would be over the edge of like a counter or over the edge of a step and it's turned backward, but it could just be a regular uh, tile. And they like to lay their eggs on the back sides of tiles. So the reason why you like to have them lay their eggs on a tile, and here's newly laid eggs. So this is what they look like. And I'll show you in Finding Nemo, you see what the newly laid eggs look like. They're very small as compared to the fish, but they're these bright orange color and they're all stuck onto the surface on that in that picture they're laid on the rock day zero so that's a pair of our clowns who still lay eggs and those are the eggs that they've laid on the on the tile like a nice orangish kind of yellow color and then um as the development happens there's an egg case and how the egg is stuck to the tile is when the female lays the egg the egg is adhered to the surface. This is like the little glue part. And then the uh, embryo develops inside the egg. So there's a clear egg case. And this is from the beginning of uh, development. And then uh, the 
fish continues its growth, the thing that's noticeable is the yolk sac and the eyes. So those are the eye spots and the yolk sac. And as time goes on, their eyes are really black in color. And this is a day-wise development. So it's day zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this is the eighth day when they hatch. So there's a pair of clowns. The reason why you want them to lay their eggs on a, that ceramic tile is if the eggs are born in the aquarium, as soon as the eggs hatch and the babies get out in the water, they get eaten by other fish, eaten by anemones, they picked up by filtration, they're done. So a lot of our clowns, they have babies that hatch and none of them survive. There's never been a recorded instance in captivity of a baby clownfish surviving without you helping the process. So by helping the process, what I do, and what other breeders do, is the clownfish have laid their eggs on that tile in a tank as part of filtration. Then this is a separate, empty, bare tank. There's no other predators in the tank. There's no filtration hooked up to the tank. There's no way for the fish to get out. You can move that tile into the tank with the water the fish were in and leave the fish in with it, and they'll tend to the babies. They'll tend to the eggs. And what I mean by tending to the eggs, you'll see in a video, they'll uh, wave their fins in front of it to aerate the eggs, but they also look for eggs that are uh, not fertile because those non-fertile eggs will mold and the mold will spread throughout all the rest of the eggs. So the fish are constantly looking to make sure the development's right. And if a fish is, if a baby is not developing right, the parents will, they'll eat it. They'll take it right off and they'll eat it. They'll get rid of it. And they keep the surface clean and they uh, guard, from, guard from predators. Because on hatch night, the night that those babies hatch, I take the parents out of that tank and then the babies hatch in this water, and then you have babies just in the water. So this is the day before hatch, and you can see there's lots of babies. Every single one of these little things is a baby fish. Those are all baby clownfish. There's a lot of them. You can count them. You can, how I, actually, how I usually count them is you take a picture just like this, and I put it up on the screen, and I take my, like, stylus, and I put, like, a dot over each one, and I count them up. So there's, you know, 500, 800 eggs there. Those are all potentially baby fish. And on hatch night, their eyes change from being black to being silver. And most clownfish, it's day eight. So I also have to pay attention every day to watch to see if the clowns are laying eggs. And if they lay eggs, that's day zero. Then you count, and the eighth night is when they hatch, usually. But the hatch night depends upon the species, the temperature of the water. Uh, it also depends upon the nutrition of the parents, because the parents are malnourished. If the female is malnourished, then the yolk sac doesn't have much energy and the babies won't hatch out. If the nutrition of the parents is good, then the yolk sac is uh, very energetic and the babies not only make it through full development, but then they'll hatch out on that night. So there's another, here's some other ones on a rock on hatch night. So you can see that there's uh, some silver going in their eyes. And then what I do is the clownfish will hatch as soon as it goes dark. So out on a reef, you know, there's day and there's night. On hatch night, as soon as the sun goes down and it gets dark on the reef, that's when the babies hatch. Because, uh, you know, they're highly susceptible to being eaten. And one way to prevent being eaten is to be born out in the ocean at nighttime. At least you get the first night for free, you know? So nothing's going to eat you. As soon as the sun comes up the next day, then all bats are off. So to encourage the fish to hatch, I make it go really nighttime. So here, this is a black plastic garbage bag uh, that I put over the bat, over the tank. Then I shut off all the other lights in the room. And then you wait about a half an hour. And about a half an hour later, the babies hatch out. So this tank here, this is a tank where the babies have hatched. There's about you know 500 or 800 babies in this tank. But you don't see them because when they hatch, they're pretty much transparent. And they're tiny. And the only thing that's in this tank is a heater. This is the heater. I'll go back. There's a heater in the tank and then a little air stone. And the air stone just kind of keeps things circulating a little bit. This is what they look like on day one. They're not even really clownfish yet. They're, an, they're a, uh, a larval in the larval stage. They don't have the orange stripes or anything. A couple days in, they look like this. Four days in, they start looking like that. And they're still um, not distinguished as clownfish yet. And then about seven days after they hatch, they go through a metamorphosis. The shape of the fish completely changes and the coloration starts to show up. That metamorphosis, metamorphosis process 
it's not exactly the same as like how you know like how a worm or not a worm but like a caterpillar can change into a butterfly that's a metamorphosis that's a completely different change in form of the fish but metamorphosis for larval fish into fish is just as rapid of a change and it's actually pretty deadly so if i raise the fish up through seven days a whole bunch of them will make it and getting them through the metamorphosis or getting through the morph is tough so here it actually starts at the front of the fish and works its way back uh, the orange color and the stripes start to form and then here's babies these are in our school baby fish after the morph and they're super tiny here's a bunch of them up at the top these are all pictures i took here and then here's that same clutch a little bit while longer they've got uh gotten some size to them they've been fed pretty well uh, here's another big group of them. So uh, in order to raise them, you have to raise them on live food. I raise them on uh, rotifers and copepods and baby brine shrimp. And then, uh, then we sell them. And I sell them for five bucks a piece, which is bargain basement pricing because in a retail store, they're, you know, 15 bucks a piece or so. I can get $5 all day to wholesalers. So sometimes stores will buy them or whatever for five bucks. So that's how... That's how we raise them here. And I haven't raised clownfish for a while for a couple different reasons. Um, once the, so I have to be able to sell them and my outlets to sell them are usually at shows and the shows have been off for a while. But the first show I'm gonna to go to where I can sell will be in June, but I don't have any babies because it takes about six months for them to get from the hatch up to sizable, saleable size, about six months. But people make a business of it. There are people who just raise clownfish. That's their, li their living. It's very difficult to raise saltwater fish. Uh, clownfish are one that you can do. There are a couple of their live bearers. But one of the ways to reduce stress on the oceans is to um, like uh, do captive breeding. A lot of freshwater fish are captive bred. Actually, most freshwater fish are captive bred. Like if you go to Petco or PetSmart, almost all the fish there are captive bred. In other words, they're bred in captivity out in ponds or lakes or whatever. All right, let me show you some other cool behavior that I've caught on video. All right, I'm gonna not use this. All right, this is gonna be really choppy because I have the zoom going out at the same time. So I'm gonna play it on the other one. All right, so if you're remote in the plan for the week, the first one where it says Osolaris planning to spawn, including the spin dance, I'm gonna play it on this screen because It'll actually like be nice and smooth. The uh, one of the behaviors that I notice whenever they're about to spawn is the female will have lots of eggs in her belly. She'll kind of be fat on the bottom, kind of thick, sort of wide. Uh, that's the female there, and the male in the back. And one phenomena that we observe is uh, the male does this kind of courting dance. It's called the spin dance. So you see in the background that the little fish. That's the male. And he is like, uh, yo, it looks like you're about ready to lay eggs. So he does that cute spinny thing, which I guess female fish like. And they'll spin clockwise, spin counterclockwise. Sometimes, yeah, exactly. Like it's it's a common thing, you know? The uh, Sometimes the male, will, I've caught the male get into a spin and almost, I don't want to say spin himself dizzy, but just go for like a minute straight. Just like go in a real tight spiral. And there's the male cleaning the surface. So the male and female will take turns cleaning the surface, make sure that there's no algae or residue left on the surface. And uh, that's that's them getting ready. So I'm in there videoing that action. And then uh, here's the spawning. Yeah, this is okay. So the, this is, the female has now laid a bunch of eggs on here and the male's still doing that. And this is in slow motion. So what happens is the female will go by and on her, uh, on the bottom side of the fish, there's a thing called the ovipositor, uh, ova related to egg and positor like a depositor. It's a tube that extends from between her ventral and anal fin and, uh, she extends the tube and the tube has a little uh, secretion, which is like a glue. And then she like 
sticks the eggs on the surface and usually gets them in a nice tight bunch, put them in a line. And then immediately following that, the male comes by and fertilizes the eggs. So there's the male fertilizing the eggs and they just take turns. She lays some eggs, he fertilizes the eggs. And that whole process only takes a couple minutes. So I've only caught it a few times. You kind of have to like, you know, watch them all day long and see what's going on and keep checking on them. Here, I didn't catch them until they were pretty much done laying the eggs, but that's them laying the eggs. That's in our fish room. And then uh, this is of them tending the eggs. So what I mean by tending the eggs is they watch to make sure that there's no problem with the eggs. You'll see that uh, this is on hatch night because you can see a little bit of silver on the black spots. They're just kind of hanging out there, but as the fish swim by, they'll fan them with their fins and that makes them kind of move around. It keeps them aerated. And then uh, they'll pick up, still be picking off any ones that are not developed right. I don't know, they go back a couple more times. But if you keep the fish alone in the tank, they're pretty chill. They don't get too stressed out. They do a good job of tending them. If it's in a big community tank, other fish will come by and try to eat the babies. And the parents are really stressed out because they're constantly warding off attacks from the other fish. Because uh, baby fish and fish eggs, they're, they're delicious and they're highly nutritious. It's a, it's a good source of food for other animals. All right, so then these are These are what they look like once they've hatched. So you can see in that water on the right hand side where it's not illuminated, you can't really see the fish, but the baby clownfish, they're just the tiniest little dots and they're pretty much transparent. What else is in that water that looks kind of like dust are uh, rotifers. Rotifers are a live crustacean that you, uh, I have to buy live ones and then you feed them phytoplankton and then the fish go around and constantly eat the little dust stuff those are uh, pink skunk clowns, they're called. And then yeah, these are what they look like hatching off. So I've also caught them hatching. And it's, it's a fine balance between uh, having so much light that they won't hatch and having enough light to illuminate the subject. But you might know that uh, amber or red light uh, is easily picked up by the camera, but the clownfish don't seem to be bothered by it. So most of the fish have hatched off. These are the same fish that you saw them tending to earlier. And there are these little spaces like here and here and here and here. Those are empty egg cases that are left on the surface, kind of like the little palaches. But then the other places where there's black dots, those are pairs of eyes of fish that have not yet hatched. So what happens is those fish are all hanging out together and one of the babies decides to hatch off. One of the babies decides it's time to go. And as soon as that baby hatches out of the egg case, it releases a hormone into the water and the other fish detect the presence of that hormone. And they're like, let's go. And they all go at the same time. So it's like a, a mad rush. Let's all hatch all at the same time. That way there'll be way too much food and the, for any one other fish to try to get us all. And we just kind of have safety in numbers, same as like the herding behavior. But you'll see here, there's some that are swimming in the foreground, but once in a while you'll catch, uh, here I'm actually using a turkey baster to like squirt water toward it, but you'll see the uh, baby clowns in the egg case, once in a while they'll, uh, they'll like wriggle and then break free and swim straight up. There they go, they're wriggling and swimming straight up. That's them breaking out of the egg case. The reason I'm blowing at it with the uh, turkey baster is to try to like mix more of that uh, hormone that's been released by the other fish in toward the babies. It's a, uh, they never move inside the egg case until that moment they're about to hatch. And then they violently swim real hard and try to break free the egg case. But a lot of times a bunch of them won't hatch because uh, they, they just don't have enough energy. Like sometimes they get to hatch day and they only had enough energy to make it there. 
and then they run out of energy. The, and the yolk sac is done and they die before they hatch out. So nutrition for the parents is very important to get all the way through. But even still, you know, if you get 90% to hatch, that's awesome, but they might not all hatch. You can still see some wriggling and then running straight up. They are attracted to light. And there's also a balance here. So on a completely dark night, they don't swim toward the surface, but on a moonlit night, they tend to swim straight up toward the moon. And that's another trick as to how we uh, capture them. These are fish from, this says 2016. This is just after they hatch. There must be an ad. There we go. You see they're just these tiny, tiny little silver dots running around. And they have to eat pretty much continuously. And it turns out that once they've hatched, <clears throat> you keep adding rotifers to the water and uh, they just eat continuously. And I leave the lights on straight so they get through metamorphosis about nine days later. So they don't actually sleep at all. They just stay up for nine days straight eating. And that helps them put on weight pretty good. And then like after they've gone through metamorphosis, then I give them a night where they can sleep. It's actually pretty rude to keep them up for nine days straight, but people have had some better success with that and I've had better success too. All right, so this is 18 days after. I showed you as a still, but there's another Verbo ad. I always want us to go on vacation. There they are. So that's 18 days later. And they all swim together. Uh, they, they just kind of huddle. They're pretty cute. It's pretty amazing. They're, they're only about a quarter inch long. So they're about a, they're not even, they're, well, maybe about a half an inch. They're not even like the diameter of a penny yet. If you were to, you could line two of them up and they'd reach across a penny. They're that small. But then they just start packing on weight and just keep pounding food into them. Okay, so the other trick that I use to catch the clownfish is if the clownfish are born in an aquarium where uh, you can't remove the eggs, then uh, the babies will hatch within the aquarium water. You have to shut all the pumps off, you shut everything off, shut all the lights off, so the water is just stagnant. And then the babies hatch, but then they're swimming around all over the place in the water. And anemones can eat the clownfish. Uh, clownfish are only kind of immune to anemones sting after they've gone through metamorphosis. Before metamorphosis, they're free game for anemones. And uh, uh, the tentacles of some coral could pick up a clown. Other fish will eat the clowns. So there's a device you can buy called a Vossen larva trap. And this is a Vossen larva trap. And it's a device that's designed to catch baby clownfish. So how it works is it's a plastic box. And over on this side, there's an opening. And in this side where the opening is, you're gonna see some bubbling. Some bubbles rise up through this side. And as the bubbles rise up in this side, uh, waters, water rushes up along this side between two pieces of plastic. Mm -hmm. As that water rushes up, it then goes into the top here and starts to swirl around. The water exits through this screen. The screen's actually on the back side. The water can go through the screen, but the clownfish can't. So the whole plan is you got water that's bubbling up here, and any clownfish that gets near the bottom of the opening where the bubbling up happens kind of gets sucked up in there and washed around. So how you get the clownfish to go to this place is you take a little tiny light actually like the flashlight on your cell phone, that little LED is just about right. You put that little light right here on the outside of the tank and the 
clownfish will be attracted to that light, just the same as they're attracted to the moon. So they kind of swim over toward that light, get trapped, and go into this thing. So these are a uh, pink skunk clownfish that I've trapped in a uh, larva trap. So here I'll play it so you can see see how they kind of like run around in a circle. I think I got the place where the bubbling is. There you see the bubbles on the left hand side and there's a the little light. So the fish are attracted to that light. Then they uh, get trapped and go around and then you can take the whole trap out and then move the trap into a different aquarium. So it's one additional process and it's not easy to do and you end up losing a whole bunch of them. Uh, those are what are called pink skunk clownfish. And they're actually a little bit tricky to raise. Yeah, this is only 24 hours. That doesn't really matter. But here's them eating those rotifers, which are really, really, really tiny. You'll see that as like dust in the water. One skip ahead. So the air stone, Instead of this one, instead of an air stone, it's just an open air line. As that air line bubbles up, it just keeps the water kind of barely circulating in the tank. But unfortunately, those bubbles, as they rise up, they go up pretty fast. So sometimes a clownfish will swim toward a bubble, get trapped on a bubble, and get shot toward the surface, and it can kill the clownfish. But it's a compromise between not having circulation in the tank and have the fish rest on the bottom, uh, which they can also pick up mold and die and having the air bubble, keeping the water mixed around, which can also kill a few of them. To be honest, statistically, if a pair of clownfish have a whole clutch of eggs and they hatch, pretty much zero of them survive in captivity or in, in the wild. Uh, in order for a pair of clownfish to replace itself, only two of its babies need to survive ever. You know, like to have equal replacement in population. So it's, you know, around a one in a million chance that a clownfish lives in the ocean, makes it. From having laid an egg to an adult clownfish, about one in a million. It's really bad odds. That's the reality. Uh, back in the tank in the back right corner of the room, there's a pair of clownfish in there. And they're a pair of lightning maroon clowns. And I've noticed they've begun nesting behavior. So in that tank, there's a big one and there's a little one. I got them at the same time about three years ago. And over the last year, this one has grown to be substantially larger. This is the female. And they've begun to swim together more. And the female does nesting behavior. So what that is, is I've noticed on the left hand side of the tank, she's been like clearing out sand from a place and keep swimming up against the glass in one part of the tank. So I suspect that that's the place where they're going to start laying eggs. I've never been able to like watch the nesting behavior leading up to the first spawn, but I have a good feeling that, I don't know, I want to say any day now, but sometime within the next year, they'll begin to lay eggs. And then as long as they're happy in that tank and they pick that spot, they might then lay eggs for another 10, 15 years straight, you know, just Every two weeks, just laying down a thousand eggs, just dropping them on the surface. And uh, they're a relatively special fish because uh, that pattern on both the male and the female is an unusual pattern. Those That pattern's not found in fish in the ocean. That's kind of been a captive bred pattern, kind of like a selective, through selective breeding in captivity. And lightning maroons generally retail for around $60. So I should be able to get easily 20 bucks a piece for them. And that'd be nice. So, I mean, there's a potential. I mean, I don't have a way to move this many fish and I can't raise this many fish, but if I were to get 500 babies every two weeks at 20 bucks a piece, that's 10 grand every two weeks. But it's an enormous amount of work and there's not enough market for that many fish. Like you can't sell that many fish. There aren't enough people out there wanting to buy them. So it's also a compromise because if you have a glut of a certain kind of fish. In other words, like lots of that fish, it dramatically drops the price. People, you got to sell them for less to try to move them. It's kind of better to create an artificial shortage. So you're not raising too many and they're kind of more rare in the market because the more rare they are, the higher the price you can get. So they're always a different 
They're always a different size. The male and the female are usually significantly different in size. All right. Um, I don't keep anemones in the tanks for the fish that um, are breeding. And that's because if I can't remove the babies and the babies get out in the water, the anemones will eat the fish. The anemones will eat the clownfish. But you might know clownfish are also called anemone fish. They don't get eaten by anemones. We don't completely understand the process, but anemones will eat any fish that touches them pretty much. But clownfish live in and among the tentacles of the anemone. And the anemones and the clownfish form this relationship where the anemone provides protection for the clownfish, but clownfish also help the anemone out because clownfish are sort of messy eaters. If there's excess food, clownfish will literally bring food back and feed the anemone. And also anemones are sessile animals and they uh, produce waste and the waste comes out their single opening in the, in the base of the anemone and the clownfish will help to remove the waste. So oh. clownfish and anemones have this relationship together. Okay, so the opening scene of Finding Nemo, we're just gonna watch like about four minutes of this, but in the very beginning of Finding Nemo, you see Coral and Marlin, and they're got their baby clowns, and they're gonna hatch, and then the whole beginning part happens. So we'll watch this and try to pick out things that are correct and things that are not exactly correct, but are like passable. Like we, people don't, uh, clownfish nerds like me, we don't fault this movie. This is a very, very, very well-made movie. But, and it turns out that the people who wrote the movie know what the truth and the facts are, but you know, it's Hollywood. So they do what they gotta do. So, Coral, when you said you wanted an ocean view, you didn't think you were going to get the whole ocean, did you? Huh? Oh, yeah. A fish can breathe out here. Did your man deliver, or did he deliver? My man delivered. It wasn't so easy. Because a lot of other clownfish had their eyes on this place. You better believe they did. Every single one. Mm-hmm. You did good. And the neighborhood is awesome. <laughs> So you do like it, don't you? No, 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 I do, I do, I do. I really do like it. But well, I know that the drop-off is desirable with the great schools and the amazing view and all, but do we really need so much space? Coral, honey, these are our kids we're talking about. They deserve the best. Look, look, look. They wake up, put their little heads out, and they see a whale. See right by their bedroom. You're going to wake the kids. Right, right. You want to name all of them right now? All right. We'll name uh, this half Marlon Jr. and then this half Coral Jr. Okay, we're done. I like Nemo. Nemo? Well, we'll name one Nemo, but I'd like most of them to be Marlon Jr. Just think in a couple of days, we're going to be parents. Yeah. What if they don't like me? Um, well, really, there's over 400 eggs. Odds are one of them is bound to like you. Hmm. You remember how we met? Well, I try not to. Well, I remember. Excuse me. Yes. Can you check and see if I have a hook in my left? Marlon! Oh, you gotta look closer because it's me in here. Cutie's here. Where did everybody go? Get inside the house, Cole.
It's okay, Daddy's here. Daddy's got you. I promise I will never let anything happen to you. Me. All right, so what'd they get right? Yeah. What else is good? Yeah, it's like the spinny thing, yeah. Yeah, so what about the eggs? Like, they usually tend, they're right by the eggs more often, but they're in that scene, well, so every Disney and Pixar movie, somebody's got to die at the beginning. You know what I mean? You got off some of the parents, like, it's got to happen, right? Like, at the beginning of a beginning of Frozen, I'm like, oh, cool, the parents are here. Like, this might be a decent one. And then they murder the parents. Yeah, every, like the beginning of Bambi, Bambi's mom's like shot by the hunter. You're like, well, that's that. Yep. You got to, you got to murder the parents. That's how, yeah. Yep. And then, that's true. <laughs> yeah, but, Yeah, no cars got murdered. They should have had like a violent car crash. <laughs> like you like you fall in love with Doc and then just like that's it. Well, that's kind of what happens. Yeah. Not really. Because Doc passed away sadly. And so normally, you know, they, they would tend to the eggs, and it turns out there because well coral was eaten, right? And then Nemo's or Marlin's on his own, but then there's a period of time and it looks like all the eggs are gone. So something got in there and got them all, except for Nemo, apparently, right? So that was that. What's what stuff is wrong? Marlin was bigger than coral. Yeah, so Marlin was bigger than coral, and it turns out that, I mean, that's kind of more of a more of a human trait, right? Because they're kind of humanizing them. That typically, like in the animal kingdom, they're equal in size, and the male's typically larger than the female, and that would not be true there. There's just no way that would not be a pair like that. So that's a little bit wrong, but you can't blame them, you know, because you're like little kids watching the movie, and you're like. How come corals like got 10 times the mass of marlin? You know, kids are, and then, you know, parents aren't going to know. What are you going to tell your kid? Be like, I don't know if she just thick, I guess, or something. So you, you assume that the, the eggs were eaten by the barracuda, right? Well, I don't think the barracuda could get in there, That's but not. there could be a shrimp or a hermit crab or a snail or another small fish. Anything could have got to them, you know. So those eggs have to be tended to until that hatch night. Now, you know, apparently Marlin. No, but so she, I mean, there she also made the decision. Do I protect myself or do I try to protect the eggs? She's like, I'm going to protect the eggs, even though the Barracuda wasn't going to get the eggs because Barracuda couldn't get in, get in the hole anyway. Uh, then she got eaten by it. Like, yeah, you don't exactly see her being eaten by the Barracuda, but you, you figure that out. Just like, Right, and in Bambi, you don't actually see that the mother is killed, but, you know, Bambi's like, you know mom got killed, because Bambi's like crying and stuff, and mom never shows up again. Like, what happened to the mom? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Should be. I mean, that's all. What are the odds that the one egg Yeah, so here's the thing, is when those fish hatch, they become larval plankton. In other words, they're they're moving around with the waves. They're going to get carried wherever. So the clownfish get dispersed. A, a clownfish is never going to, like, then care for its babies and be able to keep track of them. So the probability that Nemo would ever make it back there or be around there is very, very, very slim. 
that's that's in reality. That's not to like ruin the story, but you know, the reality is it takes both the parents, the parents tend to the eggs, but then as soon as the eggs hatch, those babies are gone. There are other fish where the parents help raise the kids, but there's no help in to raise the kids. It's just a matter of numbers. Because what the parents are the parents deal with energy is, is like they're eating, producing eggs, and just cranking out babies like crazy, hoping that some survive. Other fish who tend to their babies and who like raise the babies, they then have a longer uh a longer period between gestations. In other words, they'll, you know, lay the eggs, help raise the babies. That might take a month or two, and then they'll, you know, produce eggs again. So it'd be fewer, it'd be fewer fish. So different fish have different strategies. Clownfish, the strategy is you pair bond, you pick a place, you crank them out. You just crank it out numbers. You just like, it's just a matter of numbers, getting, getting lots of them out there. But on the other hand, you know, most fish are, are piscivores. And what a piscivore is, a fish that eats, eats, eats fish. Most fish rely upon eating baby fish and smaller fish. So the animal kingdom depends heavily on, you know, lots and lots of babies being born so they can be fish for bigger fish. And if it weren't that clownfish produce so many babies, the reef would have a harder time supporting other small fish. I mean, even clownfish will eat their own babies. In fact, when it's hatch night and mom and dad are in that tank, uh, if if you don't take mom and dad out of that tank and those babies hatch by the morning, those fish are gone because the clownfish, they'll eat their own babies. I don't want to say they're dumb like that, but they're hungry and there's food in the water. And a larval fish, you can't tell a clownfish from an angelfish, from a butter from a butterfly fish. All the larval fish all look the same. They're all these like little tiny transparent things. And a clownfish is not going to pass up the opportunity to eat a baby fish just because it could be its own species. They just don't know. They're just eating. So it's it's really critical. And I've missed those nights. I've I've like missed hatch night. I'm like, oh, it's going to be tomorrow. And I come in and then they hatched and they're gone. I'm like, well, I missed that one. I'm going to try again 14 days later. See what we get. So that's how they go. So Finding Nemo, you know, most of it's right. They're living in the anemone. They're oftentimes they, they lay their eggs at the base of an anemone. And it turns out that that first, like as those babies hatch, one of the first things they have to do is run that gauntlet of getting out of the way of the anemone without the tentacles of the anemone eating the clownfish itself. The uh, anemones will just eat the, eat the larval clowns. So that's another, uh, another gamble they take in figuring out where and how they're going to do it. They, they did the same spot. They chose it, and then they were like, "I don't know if we want to stay up there." Yeah, exactly. And that would have been that would have been the day they laid the eggs, because that day they're orange, and it's that's it. The next day, those eggs are clear. You know, so the orange color is only day one, night one. So it's also kind of disappointing because they just lay those eggs. They also kind of suggest that that's the first time they ever laid eggs, right? Because they're like. Oh, we're going to have babies. Isn't this great? We just got our new crib and this stuff. So that would actually have been the kind of in the plot. That would be the first clutch of eggs they ever laid. And then she dies, which is kind of dumb because they're going to do it every two weeks and, you know, just kind of protect yourself, protect the eggs as best you can. And you know, you want to name one Nemo, but could have waited. <laughs> 